This is the first in a series of short films about the ongoing development of a three-dimensional illustration system called Gargoyle 3D. What you see here is a three-dimensional cursor moving around on a plane parallel to the screen. The cursor is called a skitter. It also moves around on the surfaces of objects, and when it does so, it keeps its z-axis perpendicular to their surfaces. One of the new features in Gargoyle 3D is that you can snap the skitter to the corners of a three-dimensional object, in this case the corners of a cube. And I'm going to use this to snap two cubes together precisely at their corners. I'm going to select this second cube down here, then snap the skitter to its corner, and then I'm going to drag that object, and as I move, the skitter continues to snap to things, so I can snap onto the corners of this other cube over here. Now that I've done that step of constructing my three-dimensional sculpture, I'll select a third cube up here, grab it by one of its corners, and I'll begin to drag it, and I can snap it onto the corner of this cube here, for instance. But what I'd like to do is slide it along the edge of that cube. So I'll use a slightly different gravity that allows me to, to snap it to any point on that edge. And finally, to finish my sculpture, I'll go back to the type of gravity that prefers corners. I'll select this last cube here, and I'll drag it into place like this. This is the beginnings of a sculpture that you can see near the California Avenue. This is part two of the evolution of Gargoyle 3D, a series of videotapes showing the progress in the software development of an interactive three-dimensional illustration system. In this part, I show the new developments in selection, copying, and refresh caching. Last segment of the series, I was showing the construction of a three-dimensional sculpture made of cubes. Since then, I've added a type of interactive selection operation, which lets you see what segment or joint or complete cube will be selected when you release the mouse button. I've also implemented an extend select operator so you can select several things at once. Now I'm going to complete the sculpture by copying the two selected objects and positioning them on top of the old ones. To see what's going on a little bit better, I'll show you a wireframe view of this scene, and we'll make a final adjustment to the top two cubes. Now, still using this wireframe view, I'll go select one of the pre-made cubes at the bottom, extend the selection to the other three, and now I'll take this set of four cubes and place them on the bottom to complete the 10 cube sculpture. And I'll show it to you in the shaded mode and get rid of the selection feedback. The scene that you are looking at now shows 92 cubes rendered in a hidden line style rather than the hidden surface style shown in the previous examples. What I'm going to do in this picture is select a few of the small cubes and drag them around as a unit snapping them to various points on the other cubes. The reason that this is as fast as it is, is it takes advantage of a new feature of the Cedar Imager, which caches bitmaps for pictures that it's already drawn. And all of the cubes in this picture are identical, so only one of them needs to be scan converted, and the rest can be drawn from cached bitmaps.
This is the evolution of Gargoyle 3D, part three. The new features that have been added in the last two weeks include playback scripts, a way of recording a session with Gargoyle 3D and playing it back later, and stretching boxes, where a corner of a box can be selected and dragged around while the rest of the box stretches. To demonstrate the session log playback, I'll play back a log that I made earlier today. It adds a few blocks to the scene, snapping them to each other's corners. And now it's done. Now I'll select the right rear corner of the block in front, and I'll show you how the block stretches. Here I'm snapping its corner to a plane parallel to the screen. I can also stretch the corner, snapping it to the corner of one of the shapes already in the scene. Sometimes when the block seems to be larger than it should be, it's because it's snapping to a corner that's hidden. I can also snap corners to lines by switching to the kind of gravity that prefers lines. And here you see I'm smoothly stretching the corner of the block along some of the edges of the stationary blocks. And I'll flip back to points preferred gravity now and show you the block snapping to some more corners. Here I'll let it get large enough to engulf some of the other blocks. And now I'll return it to its original size. This is part four of the evolution of Gargoyle 3D. Since last time, I've added more operations for stretching boxes, and a board operation for interactive transformations, a way to place an anchor point, and operations for scaling and rotating around the anchor point. I'm going to begin by showing you some of the new stretching operations. Here I've selected the top of a block, and I'm going to drag the top of the block. You see that the object stays a block, and that the skitter remains coplanar with the top of the block. So if I snap the skitter to any of the points in the scene, the block becomes at the same altitude as the block that I snap to. I'll leave it the same height as this block here. Another sort of interactive stretching for blocks involves selecting an edge and then dragging that edge around. And here, that edge is allowed to move in a two-dimensional fashion, while the rest of the block stays the same height as before. So here I'm snapping to some of the edges in the picture, and the selected edge is dragging along with me, making the block left justified or right justified with various parts of the picture. And here I'll show you the abort operation, bringing the block back to the side where it was when I began. The next set of operations I'd like to show you uh, are the rotation and scaling operations. First what I'll do is I'll take this block on the right and snap it onto a corner of the other block. Then I'll place the anchor point at the point where they're touching, place the skitter on this corner here, and do an interactive rotation operation to align the edge of the moving block with the stationary block. And I'll snap onto a corner. Then I'll grab one of the corners of the block that's uh, behind it, and I'll rotate that corner around until I snap to the lower corner of the large block. And now the two blocks are at the same orientation. Finally, I'll place the skitter on the upper back corner of the small block, and I'll scale that block until that corner snaps to the other one and now the two blocks are the same size. Cut. Okay. 
This is the evolution of Gargoyle 3D Part 5. In the month since the last section of this series, six important new features were added to Gargoyle 3D. The first four involve what you see when you snap the skitter to objects, and the last two involve some new types of things for the skitter to snap to. In this first viewer, I have four blocks, one of which is hidden. The first thing I want you to notice is that I move the skitter around in the scene, snapping it to things. The control points of the objects that I snap to are highlighted with white boxes. Here the control points of the front object are highlighted, the top object, the right object, and if I snap to the rear in hidden cube, you can see its control points light up as well. The second thing that I want you to notice is how the surface, the z-axis of the skitter is computed as I move along contour edges in the scene. Here you see that the z-axis, even though the cursor, which is the round circular object, is off to the side of the objects, when the skitter snaps to the front edge of the cube, the z-axis of the skitter is still computed from the cube that it's near. And here the z-axis is computed from from the face of the left cube that is nearby. The next thing I want you to notice is that the gravity function now does a three-way arbitration. If I'm near a face, but not near any edges or vertices, then the skitter moves around on the face. However, if I get near to an edge, the skitter moves around snapping to that edge, and if I get very near to a corner, the skitter snaps to that corner. The last thing I want to show you of the features of the feedback features is what I call cycling selections. If I want to select the corner of one of the four blocks that's underneath the cursor now, I may have some difficulty uh, getting the corner of the correct block. I can tell the si give the system a hint as to which block I want by moving the cursor over that block while keeping it near enough to the corner so that it snaps to it. However, this doesn't work, for instance, if I want to get the corner of the block that's behind. I'm going to use a menu button uh, in a menu that you can't see to cycle through the selections. So there I'm cycling through. I have the block in front, the block behind, the block to the right, and the block on top. Now I'd like to show you how the skitter can snap to some new kinds of objects. In particular, I'll, I'll put down an anchor, uh, like the anchor I showed you last time, and I can snap my cursor to that anchor. Also, you see that an alignment line has appeared, which goes through the anchor, and I can move the skitter along that alignment line. And now what I'm going to do is use the alignment lines to build an object in space. First I'll put the anchor on the corner of that block, and then what I'll do is I'll select the block and copy it, skating it along the alignment line, and I'll make another one here. I can choose an alignment line at a variety of uh, elevations and azimuths. Here I will turn on another line that's, that's vertical but is still in the plane parallel to the screen. And finally uh, another one that goes in and out of the screen. And I can use these two new alignment lines um, to place a set of objects that are forward or behind the first cube or above it and below it. This is the evolution of Gargoyle 3D Part 6. Since last time, five major features have been added to Gargoyle 3D, including the ability to make the vertices of blocks hot so that they trigger alignment lines, a new kind of feedback 
that helps you tell which alignment line you're snapping to by highlighting the vertices that trigger it. Intersection points of alignment lines with alignment lines are computed and can be snapped to. The slopes of objects in the scene can be measured and hidden faces can be selected. First I'd like to show you some hot vertices. I've selected the top face of this block and I'll make all its vertices hot. Now I'll turn on some left-right alignment lines and some back-front alignment lines and I'll use them to position a second block in front of the first. Now I'll make the top vertices of that block hot and position yet a third block. Now I'm going to make the vertices of this last block hot and I'm going to move the skitter around in the scene a bit. Notice that as I snap to an alignment line, the vertices that trigger that alignment line light up with what I call a starburst. In this case, there are two starbursts because two vertices trigger the same alignment line. In this case, four vertices trigger the same alignment line. Notice also that when I snap to an intersection point, two pairs of vertices light up with the starbursts. Finally, I'm going to make a copy of one of the blocks and snap it to the intersection point, and then turn on some vertical alignment lines, select the whole scene, and make a copy of itself directly above itself. Then I'll make everything cold so we can look at the picture. In the next scene, I have a block letter F positioned randomly in space. I'm going to measure one of its edges by snapping to a vertex and then to a vertex at the other end of the edge. And now I'm going to come up to the menus and click Add. And you notice that the measured azimuth value and slope value are added to the azimuth menu and slope menu respectively and the azimuth slope pair corresponding to that direction in space are added to the alignment line menu. Now I'll come back down to the F and make one of its vertices hot and an alignment line with the same slope and azimuth as that edge is added to the scene. Finally I'll make a copy of the F placing it to the right of the original F in the relative orientation of the F itself. In the last scene, I have part of a room showing two of the walls and the floor. And I'm going to use this picture to show you more trigger feedback and to show you how to select back faces. First of all, I'm going to select the faces on the two walls and make all of their vertices hot. Then I'm going to turn on left-right alignment lines and back-front alignment lines and already we're beginning to have a grid of alignment lines in space. Already this is a bit cluttered, but you see that by using the starburst feedback, you can tell that here I'm at the intersection point of two alignment lines on the topmost horizontal plane. And as I move down to here, for instance, I'm on an intersection point of two alignment lines of the next plane down. Now I'll make everything cold again and show you how to select back faces. Here I've clicked over a, a block in the scene and the front face of that block has been selected. By using the cycling selection mechanism I showed you last time, I can also select the hidden bottom face of that block. If I wanted to select its left hand face, I would click near its left hand side like this and then cycle. And here I have its left hand face. And if I continue to cycle, Let's try that again. If we select a face from this cursor position here and then cycle through the selection, we get first the front face of the block we were over, but as we cycle, we see in turn the left face of that block, the right face of the block next to it, and the back face of the block next to it. Let me cycle around again to the right face of the block next to it and now I can use this selected face 
to drag the left hand block and create a hole in my shape. This is the evolution of Gargoyle 3D Part 7. I'm about to show you four new features that have been added to Gargoyle 3D. You can now add blocks to the scene by stretching them in with the mouse. You can select all of the objects that fall within a block-shaped bounding volume. You can change line and fill colors of shapes, and you can snap the skitter to the intersection of alignment lines with block faces. In this first scene, I've placed some blocks in space, and I'm going to stretch some new blocks in between them. So I place one corner of my new block, I begin to stretch it, and then I snap onto a corner of an existing block. And I'll add one last block going backwards through the scene. In this second scene, I'm going to show you one form of block select. I place the corner of a new block, and then I begin a block selection operation. A wireframe block appears and stretches around. I'm going to make it paper thin so that it only selects the front faces of those blocks. And then I'm going to show you the new color changing operations. I can make all of those faces black, like so. Now I'm going to select all the blocks and show you the new line color changing operation by making all of them white. In this third scene, I've constructed a Rubik's Cube and begun to rotate some of its faces. I'm going to show you how to rotate some of its other faces. First of all, I'd like to rotate this center vertical slice of nine blocks around the center of this face over here. In order to do this, I'm first going to select the centroid of the very center cube and make it hot. I'm going to turn on some alignment lines. Now I'm going to show you how I can snap the skitter to the intersection point of this alignment line with the face. Notice that the centroid has an asterisk appear on it to show that it was involved in the intersection point I'm currently snapping to. Next, I'm going to select that whole vertical slice of blocks. Again, I'll place the skitter to indicate one corner of the new block volume, and then I'll use a different kind of block selection operation that only selects objects that are completely contained within the block. And now I've selected the whole slice. If I place the anchor on that intersection point I talked about, I can now transform this slice by 180 degrees around that anchor point. To finish my Rubik's Cube pattern, I'm going to do one more rotation. I'll place the anchor this time in the center of the face of this top center block, place the anchor there, and now I'm going to select a horizontal slice of nine blocks. Now I'll finish the construction on the color display. Here's the cube on the color display, and I'll click the transform button to rotate that horizontal slice by 180 degrees. Those of you who use the Rubik's Cube may recognize this as the cross pattern. This is the evolution of Gargoyle 3D Part 8. Snapdragon in three dimensions has really come together since the last segment of this series. I've implemented a line segment class so that we no longer have to work entirely in the blocks world. Also, in addition to the alignment lines that were there before, I've implemented alignment planes, alignment spheres, and their intersection circles, all of which are gravity active and can be used for precise point placement. 
Let's begin with a blank viewer. You will recall that when I move the skitter around and there aren't any objects in the scene yet, the skitter moves around in a default plane parallel to the screen. Let me place the end point of a line segment on that plane and then begin rubber banding a line segment. It's other end round on line as well. So when I'm done, the whole line segment lies in a plane parallel to the screen. Let me make one of its endpoints hot. And now let me turn on some alignment planes. My first alignment plane is more or less horizontal. The feedback for this alignment plane is a small parallelogram. Actually, it's a square in three dimensions, but after the perspective projection, it appears on the screen as a little parallelogram to hint to me that this is a horizontal plane. If I grab the other end of the line segment and begin to drag it, its end snaps into this new alignment plane, and the alignment plane feedback thickens and darkens, and a starburst appears in the center to show me which alignment plane I'm on and which point in the scene is triggering that alignment plane. Now let me add another alignment plane. This alignment plane is more or less vertical and serves as a sort of left wall to our three-dimensional space. Also notice that the intersection line of the two alignment planes was computed automatically and drawn. Now if I move my uh, endpoint around in the scene, it will move around on the horizontal plane in this region as before, but if I cross over the intersection line, it now moves around on the left wall plane, and the parallelogram for the left wall plane highlights to show me that I'm on that plane. If I snap the endpoint to the intersection line of the two planes, both planes highlight to show me that I'm on both of them. Let's take this one step further. I can add one last plane that gives us more or less of a back wall to our space. I can snap the endpoint of my line segment to various of the intersection lines of these planes, and you see they light up in pairs to show me which intersection line I'm on. Now I'm going to turn on Face's preferred gravity so that I won't be able to snap to the intersection lines anymore. And I'll show you that we're in a room that has three walls. In this region, we can move around on the back wall of the room since that's the nearest plane in our line of sight. In this region, we move around on the floor plane. And in this last third, we move around on the plane of the left wall. Since we have these walls around, let's draw on them. I'm going to draw a triangle on the back wall of the room, another triangle on the left wall, and a third triangle on the floor. Now I'm going to turn on points preferred gravity and finish the triangles in a precise way. Finally, to give you a feeling for the three-dimensional nature of this scene, I'm going to snap my skitter to this vertical line, place the anchor point there, and rotate all the shapes around the y-axis of the anchor. Now let's see what we can do with alignment spheres. In this scene, I have a line segment with one endpoint hot, and I've activated alignment spheres of radius four inches. The sphere doesn't appear as four inches on the scene because we're looking at it in perspective. Again, let me select the endpoint of a line segment and drag it around in this new space. As usual, in this region, I'm moving around on the default plane. But as soon as I move into this circular region, I'm actually moving on the surface of a sphere. And you can watch as the line, point, the line segment endpoint moves around on the surface of the sphere. It appears more or less foreshortened in the two-dimensional view, depending where on the sphere I put it. Wherever I put it, 
the line segment is now four inches long. If we wanted it to have a particular orientation as well, we might add an alignment plane. In this case, I've once again added the horizontal alignment plane. And now, as I drag my point around, I can snap it to the intersection circle of the alignment plane with the sphere. If, in addition, I wanted the line segment to be along a particular line, say this one, then I could turn on that kind of alignment line. And now I can snap the line segment to that alignment line, including the intersection point of that alignment line with the alignment sphere. Of course, I can still snap the skitter to the other objects in the scene as well. Let's add another alignment plane. As we add more alignment planes, the system computes more and more intersection circles of these alignment planes with the sphere that's already in the scene. And I'll add one last alignment plane. And I'll leave the line segment at this orientation four inches long. In the last scene, I'm going to use the alignment spheres to create a tetrahedron. I begin with a single line segment, one of whose ends is hot. And again, I'm going to turn on the alignment spheres of radius four inches. I'll take the endpoint of this line segment and snap it to the intersection point of the alignment line with the alignment sphere. So it's now at a known orientation and it's four inches long. If I make its other end point hot as well, I now have two alignment spheres. And you notice that the system automatically computes the alignment circle of the two alignment spheres. If I add a new line segment ending on that intersection circle, wherever I place this new point, the new segment will be four inches long and will be four inches away from uh, both of the endpoints of the original line segment. In other words, we now have two of the edges of an equilateral triangle. And I'll add the third edge of that equilateral triangle, snapping it to the original endpoint. Finally, I'm going to make the last vertex of the equilateral triangle hot. And what's going to happen is that a new alignment sphere is going to be added centered on that point, And its intersection circles with both of the existing alignment spheres are going to be computed. Let me turn off the alignment lines. So here we have the sphere that was newly added to the scene. And here is it, its alignment circle with the sphere on the right, and its alignment circle with the sphere on the left. Let me uh, make that point cold and then hot again so you can see exactly what the change to the scene was. Now let me use these alignment circles to place the last point of a tetrahedron. The three intersection circles, this one, this one, and this one, all meet at a single point right up here and at another point down at the bottom. I'm going to add a line and an alignment, I'm going to add a new line from that intersection point to one of the vertices of my equilateral triangle. And now I have all of the vertices defined for a tetrahedron. So I'll get rid of my alignment spheres and finish the tetrahedron by snapping line segments to endpoints. Finally, I'm going to select my new tetrahedron and make a few copies of it. to make a larger tetrahedron out of four tetrahedra.
This is the evolution of Gargoyle 3D Part 9. Since last time, four new interesting features were added. You can rotate objects around the y-axis of the anchor. Alignment operations now appear in session scripts and can be played back. The intersections of segments are computed and gravity active. And there is a new operation for using snap dragging to place the viewpoint. I'd like to start out by showing you uh, a movie that I made with Gargoyle 3D yesterday showing the construction of an octahedron. The anchor is placed, four-inch spheres are used, and three orthogonal planes define the coordinate system in which the octahedron can be constructed. First I draw two squares, and then I finish by drawing a third square using the vertices that are already there. Now that we have an octahedron, I can show you the computation of intersecting line segments. I'll stretch two line segments across the center of the octahedron and use this as a way to once again recover the center of the octahedron. I could place the anchor at that point and then continue the construction. In this third scene, I'm going to show you a lot of the three-dimensional snap dragging operations and use them to put a tetrahedron on the side of an octahedron. First, I translate the tetrahedron to the octahedron. And then I place the skitter on the end point of one of its line segments and rotate that line segment to be collinear with the line segment of the octahedron. I then grab the corner of the tetrahedron and scale the tetrahedron up until the two edges are congruent. Now I'll place the anchor on the shared edge and I'll use the new rotation operation around the common axis to snap the tetrahedron onto the side of the octahedron. In this last scene, I'll show you how to place the viewpoint. First of all, I'm going to review how one can rotate an object in the scene. I've selected this elbow shape, and if I place the skitter on one of its corners, and then begin to rotate the skitter using the alignment plane in the scene, I rotate the shape so that the plane of the alignment plane maps onto itself. I'm now going to abort this operation and turn on Move Camera Mode. When I'm in Move Camera Mode, I have available to me all the same snap dragging operations that I usually have available to me, except the effect of them is different. If I select a block, for instance, and rotate it again around the center of the anchor within a plane, when I'm done with the operation, the viewpoint will be moved so that the object I had selected will be positioned where it is now and all the other objects will appear to move too because actually the scene hasn't changed at all. It's only the viewpoint that's changed. One interesting way about, one interesting property of this way of moving the viewpoint is that one can move, use all the snap dragging operations when moving part of the scene uh, in order to affect the viewpoint.